Good evening and welcome on behalf of the Queenstown Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the 2020 ASB Great Debate and what a great debate it is going to be. It's starting uh, just, I think, by the very fact of our presence in this room, the fact that there are more than 400 of us for the very first time on this campaign, uh, the fact that there are 400 of us, eight, <laughs> give it up for Alert Level 1, a sold-out traditional town hall debate, the very first one of this campaign. I'm Tova O'Brien. I will be your moderator this evening, though um, moderate probably isn't the right word for it, given the panellists that we have here this evening and the scraps that we've seen between these politicians over the last week over fiscal holes, the fact that New Zealand First has been threatening to kill off the Green Party. Um, so although we are utterly relieved and thrilled to be here tonight under Alert Level 1, there's probably a slight downside insofar as we don't have social distancing between these lecterns on the stage. That two-metre buffer might have gone some way to um, prevent the fisticuffs and the blood spilled on the floor over the course of, uh, of the evening. Um, I am just, yeah, as I say, utterly, utterly thrilled to be here in the most special and spectacular, one of the most special and spectacular parts of the world. I spent a lot of my childhood growing up here. I spent my holidays on my grandparents' orchard in Alexandra. The dams were our swimming pools. The mountains were our hideouts. Um, so it was a real kick in the guts when I came here a few months ago with the Prime Minister. Um, and I spent a bit more time staying on with my old man and Clyde. And it was just a real kick in the guts to hear how hard Queenstown is doing it, how tough it has been for all of you um, and in the wider central Otago region. Um, and again, talking to Jim Bolt yesterday as well, the pain being felt here is visceral, which is why it is so important that tonight we hear from these guys, the people who run the country or who are vying to run the country. It is so important that we hear from them what their plan is to get us out of this COVID crisis. Uh, the format tonight, uh, pretty straightforward. Two minutes each from each of the five speakers. Then we're going to go into the pre-prepared questions that we have. And then the fun bit of the evening, um, and I'm expecting it to lift a lot when it goes to you guys and we get the questions from the floor. I know that all of the panellists are really looking forward to that as well. <laughs> Terrified they are. Um, we'll also, yeah, and then, and then after that we'll have another two minutes to hear from each of the MPs. They'll be able to wrap up and talk about, uh, talk about whatever they want again and try and win your votes. On health and safety, uh, the fire exits are located through the doors that you came through, as well as stage left and stage right. Uh, the chief fire warden, um, if in the event of a fire alarm, please make your way safely out of the building, over to the recreation grounds, and the assembly area is the western rugby posts. The chief fire warden will then check the building and give you further instruction from the rec grounds. Toilets are located off the foyer area of the hall. Uh, before we get started, it is my great great honour to introduce his worship, Queenstown Mayor Jim Bolt, to say a few words. Jim, please come on up. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome, great to see you. Isn't that great news that here we are, 400 people in a room? A couple of nights ago that wouldn't have been possible. Uh, great also to be able to uh, shake hands with people and hug people, which is um, a really good thing to be able to do. Uh, thank you for the political representatives of the parties here uh, tonight to talk to us about um, finance. And thank you, Tova, for your input in this. Um, you gave half my speech already, but anyway, we'll move on. Um, finance might not seem the uh, sexiest topic around, but believe you and me, it makes a lot of wheels go round. It underpins practically everything we do. Um, simply put, everything has to be paid for somehow, whether it's infrastructure, um, compensating for tax cuts, social programs, whatever, we all know that money is a necessity. It's no secret that our district is the worst affected district in New Zealand as a result of COVID-19. Um, our reliance on the tourism industry, which disappeared overnight, uh, emphasises that. Um, 1.9 billion ripped out of our economy overnight, pretty hard in a, uh, in a district with a permanent population of 40,000. Our challenge is to keep our community and our economy running 
until we figure out a way into the future. And that might be uh, diversification away from the position we in, are in now. Not, no better time, though, for a reset, and look forward to hearing what our candidates have to say tonight. I've put forward a few things they might like to address. Um, Short-term support for the tourism industry and for hospitality, infrastructure funding, economic diversification, and climate action, and the uh, financial effect thereof. We are in indeed blessed to live in such a wonderful part of the world. Uh, the key is to make sure that we move forward sustainably, responsibly, and intelligently. It's no surprise that people want to continue to live here and visit here. Our challenge is to make sure it stays that way. So on that basis, I'll pass back to Tova. I wish the candidates all the best. We'll listen to what they have to say. Good, healthy debate. Um, all good, clean shots and no, nothing below the belt. And that applies to you lot as well as them. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I, I mean, I think those are very loose guidelines that he's giving at the end there. I mean, you guys just do you when, when you do you. Um, the Queenstown Chamber of Commerce would also like to thank our sponsor this evening, uh, ASB Bank, for all of its input and support for this debate. So please welcome to the stage ASB Chief Executive and Managing Director, Victoria Short. Well, kia ora and welcome to the ASB Great Debate. For those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Victoria Short, Chief Executive of ASB. And I think it's really important for us uh, at ASB that we really get in and, and support the democratic process. So it doesn't matter which way your politics sway, it is so important now, more than ever, to understand what are the policies that are going to shape our future. And I guess some of the things that we've been thinking about, other than supporting our clients, and it's been really heartening, I have to say, spending time with our clients here in the region uh, and seeing how they are working through and opportunities that they're taking. Uh, but it's really important to acknowledge whether it's a virus, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a global financial crisis or whether it's geopolitical risk, the volatility is really increasing. And I think all of us need to think about how do we help build financial resilience as people, as businesses, as communities, and particularly the economy? Uh, so this is your chance to really kind of put these guys to the test. Uh, it's the last chance for three years, so I'm really looking forward to the debate and seeing you after this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, now let's dive in and introduce our panellists this evening. Uh, in the red corner, the current Minister of Finance, please give it up for Grant Robertson. And on the blue team, representing the National Party, National's Finance Spokesperson, Paul Goldsmith. A warm welcome to, please, for the Green Party's co-leader, James Shaw. <laughs> for New Zealand First, he seems to be filling in a lot for Winston Peters at the moment. Read into that what you will. It is Fletcher Tabato. <laughs> and for the Act Party, there can be only one because there is only one. <laughs> it's David Seymour. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, in the order that you arrive to the stage, you each get two minutes to make your case to the good people of Queenstown. We have a stringent timekeeper and a bell will sound, uh, so no funny business. Grant Robertson, take it away. Thanks, Tova. Thank you so much for being here tonight and choosing us over the leaders' debate. Um, I can give you a spoiler alert already. John Campbell's done a lot of talking, so uh, that won't change. Uh, folks, it's an understatement to say that 2020 has been unprecedented, but New Zealand has done comparatively well as we've faced up to COVID. But when we do look around the world, COVID continues to be an enormous health challenge with resurgences in Europe and in the US. We have to accept COVID will be in our lives for some time to come, and our strong health response has to continue uh, throughout this period of time. We've done well. We will have to keep fighting the virus. 
But our focus tonight does need to be on our recovery and our rebuild. And for me, there's five quick things I want to mention, which we'll get into later on in the questions. Our investment in people. We've got to make sure that we invest in our people, not only through programs like the wage subsidy that kept 1.7 million people in their jobs, but looking ahead to the $1.6 billion we're putting into apprenticeships, trade training, and lifting the skills of New Zealanders. We've got to keep supporting the private sector to create jobs and have the government play an active role in doing that as well, through construction, infrastructure, housing, investing in our environment, looking ahead to future-proofing our economy in areas like sustainability, green hydrogen, investing in product productivity through R&D, making sure we've got an eye on that future sustainable economy. And we've got to make sure we continue to reach out to the world. Our primary exports have done well through this period of time, but we need to add value to them constantly in areas like agri-tech. And we've got to support our small businesses. Small businesses have done it tough. This community has done it tough. But our government has backed you all the way, and we will continue to do that. New Zealand has a robust and resilient economy. We have people with great ideas and innovation. We've worked hard to get through this in a health sense, and our economy will build from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Grant Robertson. Ne nearly punctual. Uh, let's see if you can do better for Goldsmith. <laughs> thank you. Uh, there's no question about that, Tova, and great to be here tonight in uh, Queenstown. Uh, look, a most beautiful town and an area that's having real challenges uh, like the rest of New Zealand. Look, we're in a time of crisis. The economy is shrinking 12% uh, in the first uh, uh, second quarter. Treasury's predicting 100,000 job losses in the next two years, and we're seeing never-ending deficits as far as the eye can see and no path back to prudent levels of debt. We have every confidence that New Zealand can get back on track. Uh, there's no doubt that we are a great country. The world wants what we want to deliver. It's a beautiful place. We can get back on track. The only question is how quickly, and our strong belief is with nationals policy, we'll get back on track faster. So we've got a clear, clear contract, uh, contrast with Labour. They want higher taxes. Uh, they will uh, uh, put additional costs onto businesses and the producers of our wealth. Uh, and they've got lots of government programs as their solutions, including many pet projects uh, from our friend David uh, and Mr Shaw here, uh, the light rail down Dominion Road, back where I come from, and those things. The contrast with National is clear. We want to lower taxes. We're, we're going to introduce a stimulatory tax cut on the 1st of December, which will give uh, people on average incomes $3,000 in the hand uh, to help stimulate the economy, get some Aucklanders coming down here and spending some money. We're going to increase depreciation rates to encourage businesses to invest and grow and, more, and, and grade, improve their productivity and hire more people. Secondly, we'll do everything we can to make it easier for businesses, large and small, to take on workers. And the recipe for that hasn't changed. Lower taxes, pushing back on regulation, allowing people to invest. And finally, as a, uh, as a government, we'll invest in quality infrastructure that will really make a difference and boost the productivity of the country. So we can get back on track. It's just a question of how quickly we want to do that. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you, Paul Goldsmith. Coming in under time, so I don't mean I don't know if that means that we pass that time then on to one of your colleagues, Paul Goldsmith, that you can nominate. But um, for the next up is James Shaw, the co-leader of the Greens Party. To say that we are in an unprecedented moment is, of course, obvious. But what is less obvious is where we go from here. As we weather the economic storm of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, there are actually three long-term challenges. Uh, that we need to deal with as well. The climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the crisis of deepening poverty in Aotearoa. And all of these things can be solved together. Because right now, we are bringing forward billions of dollars and injecting it into rebuilding our economy. We have to put that money to work on the long-term challenges that we face. Because if we don't, then our children will end up paying twice wants to pay back the debt from the pandemic crisis and again to deal with those long-term challenges that they inherit from us. Now, previous governments have responded to economic crises by trying to get back to the status quo, to business as usual, as fast as possible. Now, that is understandable, but we quite simply cannot afford to do that again. We need to plan our recovery to create thousands of new, high-value, clean tech jobs in the low carbon economies, uh, economy of the future. 
to restore and replenish our natural environment as a function of how we do business and to make sure that we leave no one behind and that everybody has enough to make ends meet and to put a roof over their heads and food on the table. That is what we mean when we say, think ahead. Now, because of what the Greens have done in government over the course of the last three years, more people up and down Aotearoa can now make ends meet, our economy is cleaner and greener, and we are restoring our natural heritage. But we are just getting warmed up. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you very much, Dan Shaw. Fletcher Tabitou, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, everyone. Fletcher Tabitou, Deputy Leader of New Zealand First. Look, thank you so much for letting me into Queenstown. I'm from Rotorua, so traditionally we have, you know, you know a tough relationship. Look, I just want to stand here tonight on behalf of New Zealand First and remind you of the commitment we made when we got into government last election. We said we would uh, put a human face on uh, capitalism. We know that that's what our, our country needs to move forward, and that is our commitment as we move forward post-COVID. The economy has to be at the heart of this recovery. We proved to you uh, over the last three years what we could do. We were paying down debt. We were growing the economy every year, and in fact, we were investing in the fundamentals of this country so that we had more teachers, more nurses, more doctors, and that money was circulating around the economy. And things were going really well here in Queenstown. And then COVID hit. So the commitment now is to say to you that our focus will be on the economy, and particularly on a commitment around no new taxes, a focus on SMEs, a commitment that we know that good environmental and good sustainable focus is good business practice. And unlike uh, the National Party, who introduced more regulation for small business than at any other time in the last nine years, we will make a commitment to small business that will make it easier to get on with the job, to get on employing people and doing good things and innovative things in this economy. Uh, what I want to conclude on is simply to say to you that uh, I'm quite surprised at the reception that the ACT Party leader got, but, uh, you know, each to their own. Get used to it. Uh, but he's going to be... <laughs> he's going to be, no matter what he says, he will be in opposition. He will be in opposition. He will That's be in Parliament, on though. the opposition benches. And New Zealand First <laughs> needs to be back in the heart of government again. So that is my commitment to you and everything that I have said thank, tonight. Thank, thank you very you, much. Fle and on that, that's it. Thank you, Fletcher Tabito, who has also provided an elegant segue to you, David Seymour. Yeah, look, thanks, Tova. Uh, thanks, ASB and the Chamber, and Your Worship, the Mayor, and everyone for coming out tonight. I've been travelling around the Lower South Island for the last few days and starting my speeches with a tribute to Kate Shepherd because this weekend being as a 127 years since her great achievement. There's three things I like about it. It was New Zealand leading the world, being exceptional. It was achieved with free speech. She's probably the greatest orator, if you read her speeches, this country's ever produced who sadly never sat in Parliament. And finally, it's about every New Zealander being alike in dignity. And those are the kinds of values that I think we need as we face this crisis. We actually need to confront the fact, through honest debate, that we've been told some things that aren't true. Hard and early when we were the 63rd country to get it. Gold standard contact tracing when one outbreak means six weeks of restrictions while the contact tracing catches up. Actually, we need to ask ourselves how we can be Taiwan smart and stop comparing ourselves with the worst. You just said, have you been to Melbourne? Let's start comparing ourselves with the other five or six states that are doing really well, Grant, better and aspire, yep, to, be, Wales, and aspire right. to be yep. better, rather than comparing ourselves with the worst and using fear from the podiumocracy, Grant. <laughs> we, actually, we, actually, we actually need to ask how we rather can be alive, deal David. with the debt. You know, I've got more young people coming to my meetings, some of them toddlers, and I think they're worried about the debt. I think they've, I think, I think they've read the pre and they know that they're going to get a driver's licence and maybe go to university before this guy sees the New Zealand government balance a budget because they've got 15 years of deficits 
coming down the track. And if we can be honest about public health and honest about the death, then we can talk about how we come out of this crisis as a more united country and get our lifestyle back, rebuilding our economy and our productivity. That's what we want, and that is what the ACT Party is campaigning on. Thank you very much. Thank you, David Seymour. Ladies and gentlemen, the tone is set, and I think uh, Kate Shepherd would be so proud of the gender diversity on the stage here this evening. <laughs> The plan was to start uh, the night on debt. We were going to move through debt, productivity, productivity and then talk about our borders. But because the politics around the economy has been so rip-snorting, rollicking, bizarro over the last week, we've decided to talk about that uh, a little bit. We've had a Labour Party guy having a crack at a National Party guy over poor fiscal management, which was a line which worked in reverse for the longest time. At first, we thought Grant Robertson was being... Cute, but then it turned out Paul Goldsmith lost $4 billion. So, Goldie, we will start with you. Do you want to explain what happened with your alternative budget, where that $4 billion went, and then also these reports tonight from stuff that maybe you lost another $3.9 billion? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well yeah, 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 look, Grant is running around showing all sorts of stories. Look, yeah. we made a mistake, uh, we made a mistake, we fixed it, and the good news, it makes no difference to any of our pol uh, policies or ideas that we will fund over the next few years. Because we have a, a, we have a, a credible plan that will actually, uh, that will actually uh, re provide tax relief uh, to families. And he doesn't want to talk about it because they hate the idea of any tax relief. I just uh, like and, and, they don't, and they don't like, like. Well, well, funnily enough, I just got the pre from your treasury, which had a, a, a number in it, which was out by $5.9 billion. So mistakes are made by people. We correct them, we move on, and we talk about the things that matter to New Zealanders. And what matters to New Zealanders is how we get the 100,000 people who might lose their jobs over the next few years back into work, and how we grow this economy. And we have a plan for doing that. Uh, their plan is putting up tax and making it more difficult for business. Our plan is to reduce taxes, putting hand, uh, money back in the hands of New Zealanders, and actually making it easier for businesses to hire people. And that's what I talk about. Uh, he's trying to muddy the ground. That's fine. That's, uh, that's how the political uh, game goes, but we're not going to fall for it. Grant Robertson, I'll give you right of reply, but also does he have a, a fair point there? You and your Treasury officials couldn't even print the right copy of the pre last week to hand out to journalists yeah. and, and economists, and you've also been on the losing end well. of allegations like this yeah, yourself. Well, no, I mean, that was a printer's error, literally. Oh, what Paul has done <laughs> is he has <laughs> a document, a he has a document oh. that actually literally yeah. doesn't add up, and that okay. does matter. It matters and it goes to the competence to actually be able to manage us through this particular crisis we're in now. It isn't just $4 billion. We've seen tonight that there is now nearly another $4 billion yep. that, has been, that has been double-counted in Paul's that's, document. That's not. But in the end, the worst bit of it all isn't actually those mathematical errors. It's the fact that there is a fundamental flaw in what Paul's proposing. He's got three things that don't go together. He's going to reduce the amount of revenue through the tax cuts. He's going to increase the amount of spending. And he's going to speed up the pace at which we pay back debt. Those three things don't add up. Paul, your plan doesn't add up. They don't add up. If you, do, if, if, if you don't have basic imagination, the idea is if you stimulate the economy early on uh, and get New Zealanders uh, spending again, get the economy ticking over, you continue to invest in quality public services, I would, I would, yeah, and then over like, the decade like to, you pay back. I'd like to bring in David Seymour here, because David well, Seymour, you well, want to work with the National Party. Yeah, Will I you just, be going for the Finance Minister role, perhaps? No, 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 I need to do it. Can I just say in defence of my constituent? First of all, the real problem here is that, you know, they, they say in politics you get a billion here, a billion there, all of a sudden you're talking real money. You know, the problem is this guy likes to politicise it, but he's the finance minister who took us to a place where a billion bucks just ain't that much money anymore. You know, the problem is that so David, what would you have done? What got, would you have done? Would you have not done, done the wage subsidy? Is no, that what you're saying? No, here we go, Grant. You always no, got to interrupt. Would you, always got to interrupt. Would you have done the wage yeah. subsidy? Well, you, you finished now, I'll tell you. These, these people yeah. want to know. Yeah. Absolutely, you've, you've got to do the way something. Oh, so There's you no would question about that. that. Right. Settle, so here's, settle, the, right. here's the question. But here's the question. Would I have done the green school? Because you see, you've been spending money. 
Ed, 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 your COVID recovery and response fund has been spending money at $11.7 million an hour since May. And poor old James got in trouble for the green school. That was just one hour of it. So here's the real problem. Here's, here's the real problem. So come on. That you are $13 billion, you are, you 13 are billion so, dollars on the yeah, wage subsidy are, versus $11 yeah. million. So you do you know are, the difference, are, eh? Yeah, I do, but the point is, you are so fiscally irresponsible. You say, oh, it was all the right. wage subsidy. Actually, that green school fund was a $3 billion fund, and that's the problem, Grant. You have a billion here and a billion there. All of a sudden, you're talking real money, yeah. and then you blame him for missing four About billion. Three hundred million of that three billion in this community, David. So, are you oh, okay. saying to the people of Queenstown, yep. they don't get the arterials, they don't get the town centre upgraded? Is that what oh, you're really? saying? So, are you saying that's part of the three billion? Are you saying there was no infrastructure? Now is a good opportunity to bring in you, James Shaw. No, no, give him he's some right of reply. If we can agree, hang on, this guy. He's piece. trying to tell you that before the COVID recovery fund, he had no infrastructure planned for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, James Shaw, you get right of reply here. I think we can agree that maybe a billion is the new million. But James, that $11.7 million that you advocated for for the Green School, given that the Nats lost $4 billion, do they have a leg to stand on they when they give you grief? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I don't. And I think that people who uh, live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. But um, David, what in his hospitals? opening remarks, talked about how we need to be honest about the, uh, the state of the economy and about the debt and so on. And I agree with him on that. We do. Um, we've had record asset prices. The NZX closed at its highest level ever last week. Um, house prices are up 15 per cent this year on the same time last year. Uh, and at the same time, we've had a, the median wage fall by 7.5% for the first time. Uh, in fact, it's the first fall since we started recording the median wage. And so what is happening is that that stimulus is flowing through wage earners uh, and into inflated asset prices. It's a sort of a hyped up version of what happened during the GFC when you're pumping stimulus money through the economy. And there is a fundamental imbalance there because the people who will be paying back that debt will be on the wage and salary earning side, not on the, uh, on the asset um, owning side. And that is a fundamental imbalance that we need to address. And if we do, then we are able to actually ensure that we can actually pay that, um, that debt back during the course of this time. And that the people who are benefiting from that asset no price inflation back debt will actually contribute and chip in a bit to making sure that we get through this crisis. We've got a Green Party with no plan at all to pay back debt. Uh, the Labour Party has no plans to have a surplus in 15 years. So as far as the eye can see, just remember, uh, Grant uh, will come along and say he's all very fine. He inherited Thank you, massive surpluses from the previous national no. government, and he burnt his way through those surpluses in two years to have us back in deficit Thank before you, the COVID right, exhaustion. You know Fletcher, Fletcher. You did. <laughs> Close before Big that. Okay, Fletcher, um, your colleague uh, Shane Jones has been saying he wants to kill off the Green Party this election. Give people a... <laughs> this is where that social distancing would have come in handy. <laughs> Give people a bit of certainty about what any potential future coalition agreements could look like, what some of the bottom lines are for New Zealand First in terms of the economy and also looking at the Green Party's tax policies, for example. Given that they're polling 2%, it's a hypothetical question, I think. <laughs> well, Didn't you just say stones, glass houses? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> let, let me start by saying tonight that uh, David Seymour considers himself a bit of a wit tonight, and I will concede that he's at least half right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one joke I heard, everyone. <laughs> you used it early. Yeah, I, I used it too soon. Thank hey, God look, he doesn't have more. <laughs> politics, the, the politics of the economy at the moment, the first thing that comes to mind for me, Tova, is the Provincial Growth Fund. We, that's been turned into a political football. But, <laughs> but, Shane Jones. <laughs> but what we know and what the people in Queenstown know is that actually the conversation now is about our rural communities being resilient and strong. Uh, job creation from the Provincial Growth Fund up and down this country has been more than 12,000 people oh, over the last few years, excellent. and it's projected to double that. And the investments that will continue to go into our communities have been massive. Now, it's got really political, but that's the reality of the situation right now. So just yes or no, uh, the PGF reinvigorating it, because Labor said it would scrap it, reinvigorating it would be a bottom line for New Zealand First in any coalition negotiations? You've got to be smart about how we grow the Yes economy. or no was the um, options. Yeah, for, the me, options. 
Yes, it is. Righto. Um, we are talking about an eye-watering level of debt as a result of the COVID crisis, also facing rising superannuation and public health care costs. James, you touched on this in your opening remarks. Um, what is your plan for ensuring New Zealand's fiscal position is healthy for the next generation? And I will start with you, Paul Goldsmith. Well, thank you, Trevor. Look, it, look, debt is an issue for the country. Obviously, everybody understands during a crisis such as this, it's appropriate to borrow. Uh, nobody is uh, going out saying we should be cutting services uh, and slashing and burning. We should borrow to get through this crisis. Uh, what the, the question is, uh, how do you plan over the next decade to get that debt back under control so we are prepared for the next crisis that comes along? And uh, late Nationals plan has our debt back to 36% uh, of GDP in 2034, uh, compared with 48% under this government because they have no budget surpluses planned over the next 15 years. And you can't carry on like that because ultimately it puts real pressure on the next generation that has to pay for it and it makes the country more vulnerable. So uh, what we have uh, focused on is making sure we have a credible plan to get that debt back down. And it's really important. You know when you get it. Grant, take it away. Yeah, look, four things to help uh, manage debt down. The first of those is we do have to be careful with our spending. It's the reason why we left $14 billion of that fund on the table to be able to manage any resurgence. It's vitally important that's there so we can do things like bring the wage subsidy back if we have to, but every dollar has to be carefully looked at. We do have to maintain support for critical public services. And the problem with the brothers Epsom on either side of me is that their plan <laughs> will mean that there will not be enough money for the basics in health and education. Oh, so we have to do that. You are misleading. Thirdly, there we've got to sustainably grow the economy. That is the critical way that we will reduce right. debt if we do grow our economy sustainably. What's your plan and fourth, we do have to use <laughs> revenue within the system, and we've done that as well. It is about a balance. What these guys are proposing will mean there is not enough money oh, for the basics in hospitals. This is like a scary bedtime David, story. David, well, 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 David, 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 how David, much, does, numbers, it cost, Grant, how the much does it cost <laughs> each year to run our hospitals? How much new money do you need each year? Oh, look, the health budget's about $18 billion and under, how much new money under, do you need under each year? X alternative budget, we keep topping it up at the same rate as no, you, you Grant. Grant, no, you Grant don't. Grant, Robertson, show us... Grant, Grant, Grant Robertson, show us the money. Grant Robertson, walk us through your figures. If, you're, if you say that the, the Brothers Epsom indeed cannot balance yep. the books, walk us through your numbers. So, in the National Party's alternative budget, they have left themselves surplus, $814 million for next year's budget to pay for all of the core health expenditure. Last year, we put $980 million in. On top of that, we put $300 million in for schools. Yep. On top of that, we put $90 million into disability services. Paul, you don't have any of that in your budget. You're not None the interviewer. Uh, there's there's $2.4 billion allowed per year for new spending under his plan. Yep, we've cut it to $1.8 billion for and new spending in a year. And a billion and, of it, and, and you haven't... And I think everybody it. assumes that National will be a little bit more careful with your money, and that is an important thing not, in a time not like this. Not judging on this week. Because, uh, because <laughs> will that, will that $1.8 billion, will that cover those basic costs? Will that cover the growth of an ageing population? Absolutely, and one of, the, one of the big differences for this year is population growth is uh, not expected to be anywhere as significant. So last year there was an extra 80,000 people we had to deal with. This year we're expecting 5,000 thousand extra people. So the, the, the number of, uh, the, the pressure from a population change will not be so significant this Page year. 19 of your plan, Paul, $814 oh, no. million dollars in the next budget, no. 704, that will mean a cut in health spending. And you we have to acknowledge that. No, you? it doesn't. It means that we have to be more careful with our extra spending and we will continue to spend extra this is spending keeping in the health and well spending. Okay, the, the, the granting pool show is over. <laughs> <laughs> James, James Shaw, what will you do to ensure that there is a good fiscal policy, a good fiscal plan in place for the next generation? Well, I think uh, debt serviceability right now is actually more important than the ratio between government uh, debt and, and GDP. Um, and uh, not a lot of people know this, but a couple of weeks ago, as part of the government's borrowing program, we borrowed $50 million from the markets at a negative interest rate. In other words, we will be paying back less than we borrowed uh, over a 30-year time period. Um, and so the question really is, what does that go towards? Now, um, we like to, uh, you know, say we did ourselves really proud over the last 20 years or so and got our, uh, you know, government debt to GDP ratio down to uh, 20 per cent. Um, however, we left ourselves with an enormous deficit, particularly in social infrastructure. So, 
housing, as you well know here in Queenstown, desperately short of houses. In every category in transport, except for seven urban major motorways, uh, we underfunded uh, population growth and even basic maintenance, particularly in rural roads uh, and in um, public transport. Uh, in free waters infrastructure, you know, people got sick in Havelock North just prior to the last election because of poor quality infrastructure. And if you know anything about what's going on in Wellington at the moment, we literally have pipes bursting from under the street. So, uh, we, that, that um, low uh, debt to GDP ratio came at a cost, and all of those chickens uh, happened to be coming home to roost at about the time that the pandemic crisis uh, hit. So, you think it and so what we need to more do debt, is to it? actually ensure that, given that we are running up this debt, that we are investing it in that infrastructure, which will ensure that we can actually then, because infrastructure is what we all use to run our companies and our businesses and to ensure that we can actually uh, have a healthy economy. Second thing is that um, we need to make sure that we uh, ensure that that debt is going towards things that actually benefit the next generation, because those are the people uh, who are going to be um, either benefiting from uh, this, uh, you know, this investment that we're making, this debt-funded uh, investment that we're making, or they're going to be dealing with those challenges themselves. And That's why I'm saying we need to keep one eye on the long term well, whilst we're dealing with the short term. No, short -term. Oh. Fletcher, Fletcher, you were nodding your head there, especially when James was talking about housing. What's New Zealand First's plan? Well, can I talk first about um, the fact the, the argument coming from the opposition at the moment is about this notion of fiscal responsibility. We inherited massive debt from the National Party when we came into government. They, were, they took out massive debt to take us out of the 2008-2009 um, crisis. Um, they, they grew the population unsustainably and everyone's paying it for, it for it now in terms of housing, roading, hospital, hospital infrastructure and all of that. So the question around debt has to be how do you do it smart and how do you make sure that businesses can leverage off it in terms of productivity? And so that is good infrastructure. That's um, sensible infrastructure, uh, roading, rail, um, you know, marine coastal shipping. These, these kind of fundamentals where I know, for example, up north in the central North Island, if we had our rail network optimised um, uh, you know, a long time ago, the margins for our exporters, especially our primary industries, would arguably be up 20%. Now, that's massive. David those C are massive David numbers, Seymour? if you get uh, the numbers your, right. Your voice counts here, especially yeah, after yeah. A, a public well, poll tonight. You've yeah, yeah, potentially... I've, um, well, I, I got a count it before the poll, but... Look, I, 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 I thought, you're in a bit of bargaining I thought, position. I, I thought, I thought, I thought James, I thought James, I thought James Shaw was going to keep talking until the debt was all paid off. Look, I, I think that, <laughs> I think, I think the reality here is that our world has changed, and the private sector businesses know that they have to live with the new constraints. My question is why the government doesn't do the same thing. And Grant Robertson, this guy's a spendaholic. You know, he inherited a forecast of a $6 billion surplus in two years' time. Two years of him as finance minister, they were forecasting a $3 billion deficit, billion and, they got, and they got an extra... In two years. Sorry, can I finish? And they, he inherited a, a surplus, he left a deficit, and they got a billion of extra tax. He increased spending by $10 billion in two years for no appreciable results. That was before COVID. Now, COVID comes along and you listen to Grant Robertson and he gets so indignant at the mere thought that government might have to tighten its belt and manage its expenditure. He thinks that's a terrible idea. Well, it's the reality everyone else faces mm -hmm. and government must face too. ACT has put forward an alternative budget where we show 76 billion <laughs> of savings Absolutely. without touching health or education. Anyone want the over energy 10 payment? Years. That's and gone. that is the no kind Kiwi of thing. Subsidies, no, that's gone. right. That's right. Super fund you contributions, would borrow, they're you, gone. Yep, that's right. You would borrow a billion dollars a year on the global debt market and give it to people to play the share market. A billion dollars a year, 10 billion yeah, over a decade. And, all of, those and, I, think, all of and those I think cuts. that's irresponsible. And all those of those cuts, cuts Paul Goldsmith, yep, the and and they're set forward, out are they things that the National Party would adopt? 
Things okay. like the winter energy payments? Yeah, no, not the winter energy payments, but there oh, come on, Paul. Uh, there's the free Put freeze. Uh, <laughs> where we've, where, where we've had. You found one you agree on. <laughs> where, where, well, uh, the free like, freeze has been an amazing pro, uh, uh, policy. It's come in. Yeah. It was designed to create more people going That's to right. universities and fewer turned up. That's right. Uh, Labor so doesn't, doesn't even want it anymore what? either. Uh, <laughs> it's, up there, it's up there with Kiwi Build as a, an example of a, of a complete and utter policy failure by yeah, this government. But look, winter energy is the same. Did we have an epidemic of people freezing to death before it came? Came along, or was it an no, election we bribe? Have a lot was of it old an election people, bribe? And one of the messages from David Seymour is, "Don't get old." That's the message from David Seymour because he's cutting in to the super fund, he's cutting into KiwiSaver, he's can cutting I, into the winter energy payment. Can I get a show of hands payment. as to who likes the winter energy payment in this room? Who supports it and who wants it gone? And who likes paying who tax support, for it? Who supports it? All right, David, you might have this one. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, guys. <laughs> the problem is Paul's keeping it though, David, can so I, I don't know what you're going to do. Well, you might have to have a conversation about oh, that. Oh. And can I, I just say you're a very wide audience. for all of you and we will start this with Fletcher. What key changes would you make to boost New Zealand's productivity performance, especially with all these new barriers which have been thrown up by COVID-19? Are we, are we talking tourism or the economy in general? In general, but tourism is an industry which has been singled out for low productivity, so fold it in if you like. Yeah, so I mean the great example that comes to mind for me is our um, investment on the west coast with the Ponamu Pathways in terms of uh, investing right now in the West Coast so that they can grow the capacity of their tourism market. And once COVID's left us and international tourism, tourism comes back, they're there, they're ready to leverage real money and real value from uh, tourists coming into the New, uh, New Zealand market. And those are examples that we can talk about across the country. I spoke before about productivity and smart investment. It's essentially uh, how you manage the debt. To be honest, to, to hear uh, Seymour and um, Goldsmith scaremonger about the generations of debt, yes, we need to be sensible with debt, Tova, but to say what they're going to do in terms of austerity and cutting back on spending would put um, not only debt on future generations, our, our children, in the next few years, but actually there'd be no jobs. There'd be no growth in productivity. There'd be nothing to go to. So you have to get that balance right. And that's what New Zealand First makes in terms of that commitment. The, the next speaker is um, getting the honour of speaking second just by dint of the facial expressions shown during Fletcher's speech. So Paul Goldsmith, with your wincing, it is yours. Oh. That's very kind of you, Tova. Thank you very much. Um, Look, uh, look, productivity, there's lots of things that we need to do to improve our productivity. Uh, um, we can start with investing in quality infrastructure. When I think of productivity, I think of the humble concrete mixer getting across town in Auckland, used to do four return trips, now could only do two return trips, uh, then you're struggling. So investing in good quality infrastructure helps. Uh, secondly, you have to have business investment. It's, it's businesses, people out there saying, I'm going to put extra money into my business and buy a new plant and machinery, get new technology, uh, hire uh, new people, try something different. Uh, that, that's how you grow productivity. You, you're more likely for that to happen if people feel confident to invest. Uh, and that comes back to uh, the, the broad recipe of, uh, of successful economic management, low taxes, predictable government. So if you've got a government that says... Um, uh, you know, just changes things uh, unpredictably, then people are less likely to invest. A good example of that is if you own land uh, like Fletcher's, uh, suddenly the Prime Minister comes along and, at Ubumato and says, well, you can't do what you're going to do on that, uh, and you've got to wait 18 months, you still don't know what you're supposed to be doing there. Uh, that kind of thing undermines people's investment uh, activity. Same with oil and gas. You come along and say, without any consultation, any analysis whatsoever, oh, we're not going to allow people to explore for oil and gas offshore. That, the, all those things uh, undermine the willingness of businesses to invest, and if you can't get investment, that's very hard to get productivity growth. The other thing is around training. Uh, uh, another simple example, uh, I'm talking to a guy um, around uh, plasterers. You know, the difference between a highly skilled plasterer and uh, not is not 10%, 20%, it's like 500%. And so having good uh, training systems in place to uh, uh, get the people in the workforce working well is critical. Which and the I'm thing that really worries me at the moment is notwithstanding all the money put into the uh, education system by this government, uh, that what they've done at the trades training area 
has turned everything completely on its head, upside down, uh, um, now created one great monopoly uh, run out of uh, the central bureaucracy. They've taken all the Grant money Robinson, off the SIT. Grant Robinson, Grant Robinson, that, take the real estate. Take the real estate. Well, let's start with skills, because it's absolutely critical with driving productivity. So uh, last week we were talking to the Building and Construction Industry Training Organisation. They now have 5,000 extra apprentices since July, since we brought in free apprenticeships. So that is the kind of investment we have to make uh, in people. Productivity is a long-term challenge for New Zealand, so these aren't easy answers, and I think we've got to face up to that. It is skills, it's massive investment in research and development, getting alongside the private sector to be able to lift the wages of the jobs that we're in. It is that infra infrastructure investment, and I'm very proud that we lifted that higher than any previous government had through things like the New Zealand Upgrade Program that's benefiting this region here, through the investment we've made in rail, and we have to make that sustainable investment as well. So all of those things together, skills, R&D, infrastructure, supporting us into those new high-wage jobs, but they require investment, and they actually require the government to be involved alongside the private sector. What, what about... What David's, about... Just so David's going to speak next, his plan yeah, yeah. involves cutting the funding for Callaghan Innovation and the R&D tax credit. They are critical elements of improving yeah, productivity. Right. What, about, what, about, what about Grant Robertson could, could specifically? What about specifically tourism, Not, which yes. has been identified? You, there's, I've heard around Queenstown um, a, a kind of common cry about our tourism minister. Where's Kelvin? Um, what would you do to yeah. boost productivity in the tourism? So clearly, tourism clearly a massive part for tourism is the tourism infrastructure. So that's the work that goes. The government side of that is the work that goes in and making sure that the roads are there, the rail network is there. That's what this community needs. It's what we're also funding. It's also on the skills side as well. We do want to be able to lift uh, throughout all of the industries in New Zealand the value of our offering. And Jim mentioned it before when he was up on the stage as well. You know, this community's been hit incredibly hard by those border closures. We've come to the party with the support that we've given already, but we know there will need to be more as we transition and we get those tourists back to this um, fantastic area. So our support will continue to be in infrastructure and in skills and supporting getting people back. Uh, Jane, James Shaw, would you like to um, pick up the most of us out of belligerence to not um, let Grant dictate that it goes to David Seymour? But um, James well, Shaw, could you maybe um, extrapolate back to the broader I mean, economy I mean, um, and your plan for well, I, lift I, productivity? I, I actually did want to comment on something that David said earlier, which was about, you know, he, he said that it was crazy to borrow to invest, which is odd when you consider that's what everybody who ever bought a house ever did. Uh, and virtually everybody who's ever run a business yeah. ever did. Um, because what you're doing is you're saying, actually, I can count on the return that I'm going to get over time as being worth more than the interest rate on, on the debt that I'm running up. Um, but when it, So you want to talk about productivity rather than tourism specifically. But if, if I mean, obviously we've got some real opportunities uh, in the digital space um, where we've seen massive growth. And I do want to credit the previous government with the ultra-fast broadband layout. It was, you know, wasn't perfect, but... We can tidy that up. It has led to a massive, <laughs> a massive increase just, just, just uh, in that sector. Just, just, just um, and uh, we, what I would argue is actually right now, uh, because um, we do have restricted movement of people, and because that sector obviously overcomes our historical problem with the tyranny of distance, that we can invest uh, in ensuring that we expand the value to that. Um, we're really keen on the idea of a digital export office um, at, at Trade and Enterprise. Um, uh, digital New Zealand has a really good five-point plan for digital inclusion to ensure that some of those people who are being displaced as a result of the COVID-19 crisis can participate in that and that there is a workforce available to them because they are kind of squeezed there. And the other thing that we should do there is actually in the, in the domain of um, government procurement, uh, we, we spend billions of dollars uh, on um, I, you know, IT services uh, and we tend to award those contracts to international companies and the extent to which they subcontract any of that back here, we tend to get the low value part of the contract. And that just perpetuates the whole cycle of low productivity because you know, we're kind of churning out low, you know, sort of the lower end of those contracts. And I think that we want to fix that to try and ensure that actually we're trying to award the high value part into our own economy so that our own businesses are building those skills and that capability so that they can then start with winning a major international I'm contracts I'm going to have to wrap you there, else. James, because we want to get to the questions um, from the floor pretty promptly as well. But um, David Seymour, just finally your thoughts on oh, productivity. Uh, I would make a quick comment about James' retort on the insight he's shared that other people in the private sector borrow to invest. Well, 
Yes, James, but it's their money. When it's government tax and spend, uh, it's not your money. And that's the difference that the Green Party needs to understand. It's when it comes to productivity and tourism, you've had your chance. When it comes to productivity and tourism, the number one thing that would make a difference would be some frickin' tourists. Vital, a vital ingredient to productivity in the tourism sector. And the role of government in this area is actually to do the public health response right and have a change of attitude to asking what we can do. Stop lecturing people what they can't. And I just give the example. If you've got a resort in central Otago in a remote location, why shouldn't the government put out a set of rules that you can follow, strictly enforce, where you can actually get a bunch of rich Americans and say to them, look, you've got to stay at this nice resort for two weeks, then you can go where you want. And by the way, New Zealand's not even on the verge of a civil war right now, so what a great place to come. Which sounds I think, awkward. I, sounds... Think, I think there'd be more than one uh, plane load of Americans who would take that offer if yeah, we decided to let them. Which now, sounds when it comes which, to, thank you very much. Can we get on to productivity which, more generally? No? No. Yes, no, no. well, it's a bit... No. Well, we got some... It yeah, sounds well, very similar to a national party policy actually on borders uh, today. No, which, I, which, who, 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 who hold, announced hold our policies? Who announced hold the first? Up. Today, so thank you, you segued us nicely into our final question before we do throw to the floor because this is the region that's arguably been hardest hit by the closure of our borders, not just because the tourists aren't coming in but also losing out on that valuable face-to-face -face contact with uh, export customers. So I want to know from all of you what you would do to open our borders safely without a vaccine. And Paul Goldsmith, I will start with you on the policy that the National Party announced today to nudge open those borders a bit. Yeah, look, I mean, I never thought we'd, I'd like to think that it would be nice to see the Aussies over here, but I mean, it would make a huge difference to Queenstown if we had Australians back. And so we've got to do everything we can to restore faith in the conduct of uh, how the border is managed. I, I remember I was on the epidemic uh, response committee when Parliament wasn't sitting the first week, and there's always been a big gap between the rhetoric and the reality on the border. I remember the Prime Minister saying, oh, yeah, people are coming in, we're at level four, they're going into self-isolation, but don't worry, they'll be checked on by the police in three days. And then we had the police commissioner come to the committee and we said, uh, well, Mr Commissioner, are you checking on these people in three days? And he said, uh, well, no, no, we're not. Uh, and, and then again, at the second time round, we were told they were being tested and then people weren't being tested. Uh, and so that's why we need to reassure New Zealanders uh, that we, there is competent management at the border. And our proposal is to make sure people are tested before they come, that we set up a, an agency that is specifically designed to handle the logistics of such an exercise, a, a, a border control agency, then would invest in co proper Bluetooth technology to ensure uh, that we could trace people quickly. Uh, and then we'll be a bit more pragmatic about allowing uh, first people to pay for some of the cost of, of quarantine, but also allowing uh, private uh, operations to come and convince that new agency that they could do a job as well so that we can get more people coming through the border. The and that's what we luxury need. Luxury so, lodge MIQs. Well, yeah, and, and a little bit of pragmatism, but always first uh, being focused on that safety and so having that, that competence and use of technology is critical. Grant so, Robertson, some fair criticism there of the Labour Party on the border, but you guys also announced today some changes around seasonal workers. Um, not necessarily bringing in new people, but deploying the people that are already in the country to the orchards and to the vineyards, which probably to some people in this room is, um, is, is music to their ears. What else will Labor do to open the borders safely without a vaccine? Yeah, so we'll continue that work, and I think it is important that it is not just about bringing people in. Some of the announcements today were about bringing specialist staff in. The rest of it was around making sure that we can have people who are here on working holiday visas or on other forms of work visas here able to stay longer, and so we've been able to do that. The Trans-Tasman bubble is incredibly important here. The policy when work, are we going to get it? The policy work on that is being completed. Both countries are now moving to a position again where we can go back to where we were before what happened in Victoria and what happened here in Auckland. So we'll keep moving there. We'll keep continuing to build our capacity at the border. We've had 50,000 people come back through. We've had a small number of incidents. And absolutely, it hasn't been 100% right because nobody has ever had to do this before. 
but we have that system working incredibly well now, and as we build the capacity, we can find room to be more flexible, but there'll be one thing I won't be flexible on, and that is the health and safety of New Zealanders. And the idea that we could have Melbourne-style quarantine where it's all run by the private sector, we saw what happened there. We work with the private sector to do it, but this is the government's responsibility to keep people safe. Fletcher, is it enough from these... Is it enough from these major parties, these policies, are they enough to fill those skill shortages, to fill the void that tourism is, is, is feeling, like Jim Bolt was saying, $1.9 billion wiped off the balance sheet here in Queenstown from international visitors? I think everyone here on this stage wants to get international tourism back into New Zealand, but everyone here on this stage wants to do it safely. And with the uh, proposition from, uh, say, the ACT Party, uh, it, it's... It kind of sounds good. You might get a few hundred Americans coming, spending up large. But the compromise to our border security is massive. And I know from talking to tourism operators here in Queenstown, if we lose our domestic market because we have to shut up again, uh, we're going out of business. So it's, it's, you know, it's really easy in opposition to talk about open up the borders, make it happen. But we're the ones, th this community here, are the ones who are going to have to deal with the fallout. And that's the reality of the situation right now. We all want to get back to normal. But for anyone up here to say they're going to pick a day and make that happen just makes no sense and it's dangerous. Tre Treasury did though, didn't they? <laughs> Treasury picked a day. David Seymour, you've, um, you've talked about wanting to have the world's smartest borders. What do they look like? Well, first of all, can I just make a comment about the, the good news today about letting people redeploy with their visas? My only question is why did it take six months to make that very obvious decision. And the problem is government just isn't moving fast enough uh, to make wise decisions. So what do the world's smartest borders look like? They set out an ex-wellbeing approach uh, to COVID, which is on our website. I think it might have been the same part of the website as charter schools, because Goldie seems to have been finding some things there lately. Uh, but the most important thing is no, don't that we coffee. look at the people <laughs> who can actually... <laughs> hey, look, we got it. Hey, mate, look, it's, it's a hard work coming up with policy for two parties, but I can handle it. No, I didn't do their numbers, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, <laughs> so, but, but look, you know, what we say is be like Taiwan, have a single epidemic response unit like their, co like their central epidemic command centre because the Ministry of Health, wonderful people, but can't do everything that you need in this area. You need government to be the referee, not the player in the game. You know, Grant says that the private sector can't do managed isolation. Really? So they can fly you to New Zealand 10 k's in the air at 900 kilometres an hour, but they can't keep you inside for two weeks? Come on. Yeah, I think the private sector I think the private sector can do managed isolation if you set the rules of the game right. You've got to be risk weighted. You know, there's no COVID, for example, in Samoa. So why can't we have RSC workers coming to places like Alexandra from there? At the moment we treat every country the same and that is nuts. We've got to be risk weighted. We've got to use better technology. You know, people like Sam Moore are going to be trying to help these guys we paid and they've been pushed away. Trial. And they've been we pushed away. James, just James, like James Rob Shaw, Fife. James Shaw and finally, the we've got oh, to compare yeah. ourselves constantly with the so best. Not say, not say, look, you know, we're so lucky that we're not yeah. Melbourne. Let's start comparing ourselves with the best and continuously we, improve by asking what we can do, not trying to scare people from the actually, podium, we've telling them what the we best, can't do. David. James Shaw, do you think that the private sector can handle managed, self managed isolation facilities, or is well, it too risky? Yeah, look, we just, I mean, we need to be honest about what's going on uh, at the border, right? Literally one in three of our armed forces is deployed at the border. Um, so on the one hand, you want to say you've got to keep us uh, absolutely safe, you want really tight border control. What that means is that we've got the armed forces at the border, we've got police at the border, we've got health professionals at the border. Uh, and so on, and that is, it, it's actually not a shortage of buildings to put people into when they come back. It's the fact that in order to be able to maintain a level of control that people uh, are demanding, quite rightly, um, that, that's the kind of human resource that you need to be able to deploy. So if you want to say, uh, look, there are going to be some exceptions to that, and there will be places at the border where you're not going to have the army, and you're not going to have the police, and you're not going to have health professionals, and you're going to turn it over to private contractors. That does open a chink in our armour. And the best 
offense, it's a, the best defense is a good of, offense when it comes to um, COVID-19 because we can see the impact just from this recent outbreak that that has on the economy and in particular on domestic tourism. Because if, I mean, we just, I mean, we know that for probably the next 12 to 24 months, the tourism industry will be primarily a domestic industry. And as we do start to um, see a reduction in the number of New Zealanders coming home and some additional places up, probably those additional places will go towards workers um, and people that we need to supplement various jobs in the economy rather than tourists. There may be some, but it is going to be slim pickings for a while. But, so, so we are going to be relying to, to some extent on, or in fact to an entire extent, on, on domestic tourists for the course of the, next, uh, of the next 12 to 24 months. And therefore, we absolutely need to maintain that elimination strategy and take no chances at the border. I because would like to know now what... Is. Thank you, Dan Shaw. I would like to know now what the people in this room think about everything that you've heard on stage tonight and hear your questions. We've got a couple of roving mics out there. Could you please put your hands up if you gentlemen in the mustard that was, you were like a coiled, coiled spring. Uh, I'm a local business owner. How do you envisage uh, staffing our restaurants when the work and holiday visas are all gone? I think you should take that one, Grant. Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, we are wanting to extend them. That's exactly what we've done today, and we want to continue to do... We, we, exactly, and we want to continue to be... Sure. Okay. Yep, sure. So we want to be able to extend those visas out. We have done that, and we will continue to do that. We also do have a very large number of New Zealanders who have lost their jobs, and what we've got to do is make sure we support those people to be redeployed into other areas and into other sectors. So it's a combination of both, but absolutely accept the fact that we've got people here, some of whom have lived in this community on work visas for a very long time. And we have to respect that, support those people to stay here, and use the working holiday visas people who are here. It is a balance. Some people want to go home. Some people want to stay. We've tried to facilitate that, and we'll keep doing it. I'd like to ask a question on behalf of young people and the children and grandchildren of the people sitting in this audience. Um, the only person who has uttered the words climate change this evening um, is Minister Shaw. He, he's provided a substantive answer about how the Green Party is looking forward. And I would like to know, please, how will the rest of you on this stage address the real threat of climate change? And I ask you, please, to consider that when this audience goes home this evening, they'll have to explain to their children what our leaders think about the value of their future. Fletcher Tabata, we'll start with you and work our way, work our way down. So that was that with you, Fletcher. Thanks, Trevor. So New Zealand First is part of this government uh, committed to carbon zero, committed to our emissions trading scheme. And I think everyone on the stage, except for Seymour, has said that um, we need to make sure that Yep, let's have an emissions trading scheme, let's cost that out, but let's make sure we don't price our local industry out of business and have uh, all this kind of carbon leakage offshore. So we, we've made the commitment. Uh, as I said in my introduction, I think smart business is about environmentally sound and having those sustainable practices. That's a sales pitch to the rest of the world, and already we're seeing uh, you know, great money being made. There was that example of that uh, $10 uh, block of butter in the US out of New Zealand because of everything that that offered in terms of our environment and the way it was made. So we commit to it. Uh, actually, the only, only contest I would have uh, with the Labor government and the Greens is the 100% um, uh, renewables. That's an aspirational number. We need to get to about 96, 98. If you go too far too soon, the cost of energy in New Zealand is going to be prohibitively expensive. It will destroy local production, and we may, need to make sure we get that right. And, and it was against the advice as well, James, wasn't it, of the, the Climate Commission? So perhaps you could talk about renewables and um, and touch on, on the young woman's earlier points. Yeah, so the Interim Climate Change Committee said that it is the last 1% to 3% that is prohibitively expen expensive unless you invest in something like pumped hydro. Uh, and so on their recommendation, we are actually exploring that, both... Um, here in, uh, in this region of the country and also uh, on a smaller scale uh, network up in, uh, in the North Island, which is closer to where it's being used. Um, I do think it's a shame, of course, that um, having committed to uh, the Zero Carbon Act and so on, uh, New Zealand first then blocked a number of the policies that would actually have made a difference to our emissions profile. Um, but uh, with any luck... 
at least we've done the policy work, and it should be pretty easy to roll out uh, starting in November. Um, in, the, in the last, in the last uh, term, we focused very much on the, on the kind of frameworks and the institutions, the Zero Carbon Act, the Emissions Trading Scheme, the Climate Change Commission, and so on. Um, but countries that have actually um, reduced their emissions and grown their economy at the same time, like the United Kingdom, have said, uh, all of that is good, and you also need to work sector by sector uh, and to say, what is the transition plan for those sectors? And so um, we are saying the first three cabs off the rank, uh, metaphorically, are uh, transport, um, energy in particular, industrial heat, uh, and um, really high-value sustainable agriculture. And so that is going to be the focus of our activity over the course of the next three years. Paul Goldsmith. Thank you. Well, you wouldn't hear James Shaw mentioning that we've increased our use of coal uh, over the last couple of years since he's been in government, which is an interesting fact. Uh, so there's lots of um, great rhetoric coming from this government, but the, um, and the, and the number of uh, electric vehicles increasing has been uh, much slower than expected, and there's a whole lot of missed uh, big talk, but not great uh, delivery, and that's a, been a bit of a theme for this government. So, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we've obviously uh, had supported... Uh, the, the broad thrust of the climate change uh, actions taken by this government, we signed up and agreed with it. Uh, the difference is that between us is, is what you'd expect is that we are uh, much more attuned to uh, what's happening with our trading partners so that we're keeping pace with them. Uh, and secondly, uh, that we're focused on uh, scientific and technological ways to deal with the issue. So if you're talking about methane, um, if the, the only solution is to kill all the cows, then that's not a good solution. Uh, but if you're going to invest in good quality uh, pastures and be open to the research and scientific work that needs to be done to make that more effective, uh, then we, we'll back you and support you in that area. The final point I'd make, and we can go in more depth if you like, but if my point I'd make as a father of four uh, and spending a lot of time with kids, yes, they are worried about the climate, but the thing that they're most worried about right now is the prospect of a job. And uh, that is number one issue right now, and uh, what we need to and hear. People can from walk and chew gum at the same time on, on those ones. Well, you can, you can, but <laughs> but, but I just but I just want to I, I want to make it clear that young people are worried about jobs as well as the climate and a number of things, mental health, a number of issues. But uh, the jobs are really critical, and if we make it difficult for for businesses to actually take people on, then that's going to be harder for young people. Grant Roberts, two questions: Are you going to kill all of the cows? And when James Shaw talks about being uh, having climate policy held up by New Zealand First, if Labour was in a position to govern alone, which it currently is on, on polling, he talks about doing that policy work already. Would you pick up that policy work and run with it? So, no, we're not going to kill all the cows, and yes, we are going to run with that. And I do want to give James an enormous amount of credit. He has worked incredibly hard over this term uh, to, to drive that forward. Um, it's, it's everything that James said. It, it, you know, it is around transport, and we do have to improve the uptake of electric vehicles. It's around investing in new technology like hydrogen, and in particular the fact that we can be a source of green hydrogen here in New Zealand. It is getting our industrial energy onto a more sustainable path. But the bit disappoints me. So my answer to you is all of the groundwork's now been laid. It's the actual implementation of the policy that will be given to us, actually, because we'll get carbon budgets next year from the Independent Climate Commission on transport, on industrial heat, on the way we generate electricity, and we have to meet those budgets to meet our goals, and we've taken the first steps with all of the things that James mentioned. But the bit that disappoints me about what I just heard from Paul is the lack of imagination and vision. The way we get good paying jobs is to capitalise on being a clean green country, making that real and investing in sustainability. That's actually how we do it. You know, I think the most important thing when you talk to kids, be as honest as you can uh, and say that the New Zealand government uh, has a ceiling and a floor when it comes to what it can do on climate. Uh, the floor is if we don't have a realistic policy, then we're letting ourselves down. And by the way, our trading partners will remind us of it pretty quickly. So we have to have some ambition around climate. But there's also a ceiling that we could choose to do incredibly stupid things like close down New Zealand industry, damage New Zealand agriculture, so the world has more polluting uh, sources of steel or aluminium or dairy powder than we produce here while we lose our jobs. The question is, how does the New Zealand government stay between that floor and that ceiling? And I'd put it to them, those kids, that the Zero Carbon Act is not it. It means the politicisation of the economy. And has it worked? Well, in the UK, 
actually their reduction in CO2 emissions per unit of GDP, pounds for them and dollars for us, has been no better than ours over the last 12 years since they've had it, uh, since until we adopted their strategy. So Axview is very simple. We have a carbon price. Uh, we base it on what our top five trading partners are actually paying. We add a couple of percent because we're good people. Nobody can criticise us for not doing our bit. There's no politicisation or bureaucratisation uh, of the economy, no grand visions that really mean politicians telling you how to spend your money. Actually, what we do is we do our bit and we get on with it. I see a raise. Who's, who's got the next question? Hi, uh, just in regards to the $400 million tourism package, uh, First of all, do you think it was a well-worked program? Uh, where's Calvin? Should, should, where's Calvin? Uh, should should uh, the government pick winners and losers in tourism business so that are all solvent? And also, uh, should the support not have been in proportion to the size of your business, not just big business, basically, as a small business operator? Yeah. Look, I mean, the first thing I'd say... <laughs> the first thing I'd say is it is incredibly tough uh, to be able, in your position, to be able to look at other businesses getting the money. And I appreciate that there is an issue and that there was a limited amount of money. We set criteria, uh, it was assessed against that criteria and 126 firms were funded under that scheme. So I accept the fact that it's hard seeing that. This can't be the only way we look at how we support our tourism industry, and it hasn't been. We put significant resource in through the wage subsidy, through the small business cash flow scheme, and now we've got that task force set up, public-private task force, set up to be able to go to the next stage of how we continue to maintain a sustainable tourism industry. So I absolutely understand that those people who haven't got the funding are feeling frustrated. We've just got to keep working together. Yeah, Paul's question was, was it well managed? And the thing is, it was a joke. How many businesses happen to need exactly $500,000? That's not proportionate to need. That's not fiscal responsibility or caring about debt for the next generation. It's got to be one of the worst administered no, funds in history. All, David. And it's I really helping, hope that the, it's that the judicial a lot of review. In this I hope the judicial review. Is it succeeds. helping the right businesses, Paul Goldsmith? Yeah. No, look, I mean, it was a, it was a kind of You're arbitrary there, arbitrary thing as well. I've heard there's a bit of controversy about a bungee jumping operation, for example. I, I talked to... Money um, for photo ops. I, 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 I talked to a, for free. a bunch of helicopter operators that they couldn't work out why the, the, their competitor got money and they didn't. Uh, and so very arbitrary, and that really undermines uh, faith in government generally. Uh, and has been an all-mark of this government. Uh, we started the National with... Party hasn't um, provided much of an alternative, though. Well, the, the big alternative, the colossal alternative, is over the next 16 months, the average, wage, uh, the average income earner in New Zealand will have an extra $3,000 in their pocket. If they've got two in the family, the they've got $6,000. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and those people will have more money to spend on coming to Queenstown and other places like that and spend it on hospitality yeah, for 16 months at a time that we need that stimulus. Before James, we get James Shaw, do you think those tax cuts will flow straight back into Queenstown's business and tourism operators? They hate, they hate the idea of giving operators? taxes back to New Zealand. Sorry, I couldn't oh, hear you like over the, the shouting. I'm sorry, Tova. James Shaw, do you think that the tax... There's a bit of testosterone here that's... Um, <laughs> tell me about it, mate. Do you think that those tax cuts that the National Party is proposing, that, that two and a half to three and a half thousand dollars for middle income earners, do you think that will flow straight back into the pockets of tourism operators here in Queenstown? Uh, well, no, uh, not directly, no. So, some of it could uh, if you were to do that, but actually what we've seen uh, as a result of the, the two lockdowns now is we have had suppressed demand. It's actually substituted into other things, right? So we've never sold uh, as many Ford Rangers in this country as we have in the last few months. Um, uh, we've had, um, you know, our uh, interior decorators and uh, people who are building decks and um, those kinds of things. Building supplies have, have done very well. Um, and so people are substituting uh, the money that they would have spent on holidays to the Cook Islands or to uh, Queensland and so on um, in other ways. Some of it is coming into tourism, and that, that's a good thing. But uh, I think the, I mean, the question really is, you know, how do we support the, the sector? And I, I would say, look... You know, whatever your arguments with over the course of the last six months, we are a country that um, had our actually our, our, um, a lower death rate uh, this year um, than in previous years. Right? We're one of the only countries in the world, if not the only country in, in the world, where the, um, the death rate went down during a global pandemic. Um, and that is because we had a colossal program supporting New Zealanders, um, both through the economic and the health uh, crises simultaneously. 
um, it wasn't always superbly efficient. But we have a moment now where we can start to make some choices about the long term and including how do we uh, design for the future when it comes to both domestic tourism in the near term and uh, the, the new version of uh, the international tourism Mitchell, what's um, operator when, first, uh, operation when we get back. What's New Zealand First's targeted plan for the tourism industry beyond what the government's put in place now if you're in a position to form a government after this election? The, the target right now is about pivoting, right? We, everyone in this room knows that it's the domestic uh, tourism market that's going to keep the tourism industry going. Everyone on stage has said essentially the same thing. Uh, tourism New Zealand has uh, taken their pool of money to communicate to New Zealanders uh, you know, have a holiday at home, come and see Queenstown. Actually, to be fair, uh, if I got the tourism portfolio, I'd make sure we actually changed the campaign. It's a bit dry, uh, according to feedback from uh, operators. So there's... And, and this talk about tax cuts kind of um, belies the nature of the economy. Y yes, there'll be... There may be more money in people's hands, but actually, if the government's spending it uh, on nurses salaries, teachers' salaries, if you start taking those away, then no teachers, those thousands of teachers, lost aren't going to come on holiday down here. So, so New Zealand First will give you some jazzier ads. Um, and, and more teachers with more money. <laughs> next question from the floor, please. Hello, sir. Hi. This is um, for Grant. Please let me finish before you... Uh... You haven't even started yet. <laughs> yeah, but he interrupts. Uh, as the finance minister um, and as the government, you guys made some huge decisions that have impacted people. I've seen no transparency for cost analysis of how you arrived of shutting down the country how you did. During the entire lockdown, all we heard was the economy's not important, lives matter. Was there a genuine cost analysis that was done on it, and is it can be transparent. You guys seem to be making decisions now without doing cost analysis for the impact. We've probably lost more people in Queenstown to suicide since the lockdown than... Sir, that's not I true, and it's a very dangerous thing to say. Please don't say it. But, but so, please so answer, Grant, leaving, but leaving please aside the, the transparency the, and the leaving cost aside analysis. the last part of the question, yeah. um, what what analysis yeah. did I, I think probably a bit of a, a misquote as well? And the government was talking about the economy as well. But how maybe did you balance the economic impacts of COVID nineteen against the the yeah. health impacts? And yeah. and was there enough transparency for the New Zealanders? The focus was always on lives and livelihoods. Um, clearly, you know. We believe that the best economic response has been and is a strong public health response because not only has it kept New Zealanders safe and alive, it's actually allowed our economy to get going again more quickly. So yes, we had some of the most stringent lockdown conditions in the world, but then when we came out of it, as we are now in level one, we have the most freedom both personally and economically that most other, than most other countries in the world. So that, actually, that analysis proved to be true. Yes, we did look at what the costs to GDP were for different levels of lockdown, um, and they're being constantly revised. ASB told us tonight that they, they, they believe that when we're in level two, we're up above 95%, I think, now in terms of activity. So we've constantly looked at the impact on the economy and the impact on health, but we strongly believe that they go together. The transparency, the papers have all been released now. You would have seen an article if you'd read it today about the Treasury's view, which was to push ahead a little quicker than we did. But we are pushing ahead. We are now in level one. And I think our benefit, cost-benefit analysis that lives and livelihoods matter has been borne out. Sir, what does your hat say? A mega hat to trigger people. She has more courage and intellect than you will ever have, sir. One very short question, ma'am, and sorry, just to one of the MPs as well, if you can, because we need to move on to their final wrap-up statements. Let this lady have a question, sir. Uh, the Queenstown Lakes District has a thriving tech scene, which has only increased due to lockdown. 
Now I'm seeing a really exciting opportunity. We've got Silicon Valley talent that live here already and they want to come over here. It's an awesome opportunity to diversify. Who's going to help me and how? Mitch is going to take this one. His hand went up first. Yeah. Well, we've, we've already uh, modelled it. We've already shown, uh, not just modelled it, sorry. We've actually made that happen with our innovation hubs around the country. The first one that comes to mind is in Hopatika. Well, also uh, the same kind of relationship with um, uh, Silicon Valley and businesses coming in. That's provincial growth fund money. Now, that's the kind of smart investments where investment can come to the provincial growth fund to show what it means not only for the business, um, and to be fair to, to make it clear to everyone in the room, every, just about every business on the PGF got loans. They have to pay the money back. But if you can enable it, if you can make it happen now, if you can do it quicker and do it smarter, then the Provincial Growth Fund will absolutely make that happen. We're going to have to leave it there, but try and hit these guys up afterwards as well if they're loitering around to get a bit more insights from across the board. Um, we'll go through the same order, I think, as we did when we started with the introductory comments. So um, two minutes each for them to wrap up, to try and win your votes, to try and convince you why they are the people to lead us out of this COVID crisis, starting with you, Minister Grant Robertson. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your participation tonight. What we need through this next period of managing the COVID epidemic is stability and continuity and a clear economic plan. That's what we will deliver. We've worked with New Zealanders to make sure that we got through this health crisis as well as most other countries in the world have, if not better. What we now need to do is build on that by investing in people, supporting job creation, supporting our small businesses, making sure we continue to trade with the world and future-proofing that economy through infrastructure, through sustainability and through improving our productivity. It is essential that through this period of time we continue to look after each other, to support the most vulnerable in our community and ensure we come out of this in a state that New Zealand can be proud of. I'm proud of what we've done together as a country. We can keep going. Let's keep moving. Paul Goldsmith. Uh, well, thank you, and, and uh, we are all proud of New Zealand and what we have achieved as a country and what we can achieve, and we firmly believe that our best days are ahead of us. Uh, we've got every confidence we can get back on track, but we've got a clear choice uh, right now at a time of real challenge for the country and for Queenstown and for many uh, parts of New Zealand. A choice between Labor's higher taxes, its additional costs to business at a critical time. Um, just last, last week, an extra week's uh, sick leave, yep, no problem. Higher minimum wage, yep, no problem. That's great when the economy is booming, but if you're struggling to stay alive and employ people, uh, those things make it harder. And lots of government programs, and we've got uh, all the pet projects from, uh, first, the Provincial Growth Fund, which Shane Jones said was, uh, to the victor goes the spoils, and then the latest uh, uh, fund, uh, which Grant James Shaw, my, here, uh, my friend here, said, I have to say I was unimpressed with the whole decision-making process. Uh, that was for the $3 billion shovel-ready fund. And so uh, what you've got is higher taxes, uh, additional costs, and lots of government programs. The contrast for us is that we want to uh, uh, trust New Zealanders with their own money, give a stimulatory tax cut, get some money back in the pocket with $3,000 for somebody on average income, massively increase the depreciation available to businesses so that they can invest and drive growth and uh, innovation, and then do everything we can to make it easier for people to take on new employers. And finally, uh, throw in some really uh, um, historic uh, achievements in terms of infrastructure development that will transform this country over the years to come. And so together, I think we can get uh, back on track as a country sooner under National's economic plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul Goldsmith. James Shaw, your final thoughts. Your final thoughts, please. I, um, I, I, I don't normally do this, but I, I do, uh, given that National are trying to trade on their uh, track record, I uh, just want to take a little um, dance down memory lane to the sheep farm in the Saudi desert, uh, Nova Pay, um, and a Sky City Convention Centre deal that was cooked up on a golf course in Utah, not to mention today's $8 billion fiscal hole. So I think you know, what you have seen over the course of the last three years um, from the Green Party is that we are a stable and responsible and strong partner with Labour in government. And we are asking for a second term, not just in Parliament, but in government, again with the Labour Party. Uh, we are asking the country to think ahead because we are pouring an enormous amount of liquidity into the economy that is entirely appropriate at a time like this. 
But whilst we are responding to the current crisis, we do need to think ahead and to say, what are we designing for as we come out the other side of the pandemic crisis? I'm very proud of the track record that we have had in this last government, whether it's on climate change or on the biodiversity crisis or the work that we've done on housing and inequality. And we are just getting started. And we are looking for your vote at this election. Thank you, James Shaw. Fletcher. Yeah, kia ora, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. My message to you this evening is a simple one. We've proven ourselves over the last three years in terms of confidence and stability. We've invested in the regions. We've invested in the people of New Zealand. We intend to do more than we have, for example, extending the 90-day trial. Uh, you, do, you don't have a capital gains tax tonight because of New Zealand First. You don't have 70s-style uh, employment uh, union setups because of New Zealand First. And as entertaining as David Seymour is, he will be in opposition telling great one-liners and not achieving Thank anything you. for you. If you want Labour by themselves, by all means. If you want Labour Greens. and the Greens, by all means. But the only way that you're going to hold them to account, like we have for the last three years, is a party vote for New Zealand First. It's not a marriage proposal. It's just three years. <laughs> Thank you, Fletcher. David Seymour, kick it off with a healthy one-liner for us. Well, look, I'll skip the obvious jibe about the fact that no one was talking about a capital gains tax until those guys put these guys into power. So, you know, they're protecting us from the threat they created. What sort of rot is that? Uh, but, uh, seriously, that's the, that's the best he's got. You know? Look, you know, the world has changed and our small island nation must change with it. And throughout this crisis and through this parliament, ACT has sought to make a constructive and consistent contribution to our parliament and our politics. You know, I stood alone 119 to 1 against rushed firearm laws, and I'm sorry that I've been vindicated by the failure of the buyback, but we also worked with every other party in parliament to pass a law so that people who are suffering at the end of their life can have some choice and control and dignity about how they go, and I hope you'll all vote yes in that end-of-life choice <laughs> referendum. You know, that's... That's the kind of constructive and consistent approach we need going forward so we can get Taiwan smarter about public health, achieve elimination without the continued threat of lockdowns and safely reconnect with the rest of the world. Be honest about the debt for those toddlers who are currently looking at getting their driver's licence before they see the government post a surplus. And then capitalise on the opportunity of being an island nation on what may be a pandemic planet for several years to come. If only we stop shooting ourselves in the foot with bad public policy. Now ask yourself, why would anyone believe that these guys are going to manage that process better than they manage Kiwi Build? Why would anyone think that the, why would anybody, oh so Kiwi was a disaster, right. Why would anybody believe that Grant Robertson who took a six billion dollar surplus and turned it into a three billion dollar deficit in two years before COVID is the guy to pay off the debt? He just isn't. You see the thing is, this party, Labor and Jacinda Ardern, can do the dance, but they can't do the delivery. And I humbly submit that X can do the dance and the delivery. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we're ending the debate with that conjured image of David Seymour twerking. Uh, but there it is. I've got a few thank yous if you could just bear with me. Uh, we, will, we will leave it there, but a huge thank you to ASB, to the Queenstown Chamber of Commerce and to Media Works for making tonight possible and reminding us why it's so important that we all get out and vote. And if you haven't registered yet, there are some lovely people from the Electoral Commission who will be set up in the foyer who can help you enrol. Uh, can you please give it up to all of it, for all of our panellists tonight? Thank you so much, guys. And um, just because um, I, I said it, um, can we please thank Tova too for doing a fantastic job. Trying to get brownie points for tomorrow's story, wrapping the debate. Um, but uh, the biggest thank you goes to the absolute stars of the show, who were you guys. Uh, 
great questions, some great and some interesting heckles, some good audible affirmations and audible refutations. Um, but thank you very much for playing your role in tonight's debate. You're the people uh, that it counts. You're, you're where it counts. So give yourselves a, a big round of applause. It's a wrap. <laughs>